Uh, thank you. Um, we are now open for uh, questions. I don't know, if, Steve, if you have any initial no, responses. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, that was a great story. I, uh, the, the thing that I, I think our community has been poor at advocating for, articulating, and gaining evidence for the importance of a diagnosis. Um, one of the things as, as an internist that I'm aware of is that achieving a diagnosis can be important, and the one slide, especially with the, the cost, if you leave out the postdoc cost, um, is, it speaks to that. And I think that you know, with a view towards what Caesar can do um, going forward, I think that perhaps an effort to document um, the value of making diagnoses in general, um, both economically and from a patient perspective, could be very important because we run into it all the time from the payer standpoint. Can I expand that, which is it's just not the diagnosis, but what we're seeing is that having the diagnosis leads to, in some cases at least, new treatments being discovered. And so it, it starts a pathway that is much more useful than if than when we say it, it, it just provides a diagnosis. Right, it can, but I think we have to be very careful there because that message can dilute, um, it can dilute the inherent substantial value of a diagnosis. So the, the success stories where you actually get treatments, you know, we've had them too, they're wonderful, right? But I think that what, what we have to articulate as a community, in addition to that, is that simply getting a diagnosis is important, and we don't want to dilute that message by implying that, that it's only the home runs where you have a treatment that, that are worthwhile. Yeah. Is, is, a, is there a role for NHGRI in sort of formalizing, organizing, helping, facilitating the, the, the crowdsourcing of the phenotype, phenotyping variable? That's question number one. And my other question is there are 265 variants in MGLY1 listed on the exome aggregation consortium server. And how many of those have any kind of phenotype at all? And of course, that's sort of a loaded question because the answer may be you don't know, but maybe Caesar or Emerge or somebody at NHGRI can figure that out. Uh, so I think there's are two really good questions. So obviously, I think there's tons of research left to be done on how best to utilize the internet to, to interpret variants. I think there's obviously a lot of potential for it, um, but where I say it's, it's very early days. I'm doing a lot of this on a very ad hoc, patient by patient basis, uh, but there's certainly some good science to be done here. And in terms of interpreting NGLI1 variants, I um, mean, we have a pretty good genotypic database at this point, but of the 265 that could be pathogenic so far, obviously we've, we've only seen you know, at most uh, two times 39 of them, so, and which is in fact is far less than that. So. Uh, it's, it's really a case-by-case -case basis when it comes to interpreting pathogenicity in NGLI-1. One, one of the other um, sort of lessons from this is in the conversation this morning about learning healthcare infrastructures, we need to think about how to make that sort of patient and family-centered or patient and family-partnered infrastructures and not simply clinician or health system-driven infrastructures. And Sharon I, and Gail? I, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that thank you for the talk, and I, I think that we should... I think you've only shown us a small piece of it. So I'm a type 1 diabetic, and there's a parent group called We Are Not Waiting for the Night Scout Project. And I follow them on Facebook, and they've literally hijacked the data from glucose sensors. They've created on the cloud databases. And the parents who technically don't know how to do this, there's a group of computer savvy parents who then every day on Facebook help these parents set up much, much better, let me tell you, much, much better web page showing their children's data than the current FDA approved versions. And so I do think that, and their, their, their logo is we're not waiting. And so I do think that we should really think in CSER 2.0 more about how to engage the parents and the families than we have in, in, in CSER 1 when it was all very new because it is just amazing that wealth of energy and activity that I don't think we included in our projects. Yeah.
Thank you. Boy, this better be good. You've had to wait for 25 <laughs> seconds. So, so I, I really want to congratulate the panelists and also the comments that came out, especially Sharon's, had some similarity to what I wanted to say. I've been sort of waiting for this moment in our discussion to, to ask people to seriously consider how information is not under the control anymore of researchers and um, clinicians who, who feel that they need to um, exercise a very strong moral obligation to return or not return because of professional norms and guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, that the world we're in now, and you know, there are these terms, uh, citizen scientist is one, but then there are a lot more kind of offbeat punk, science punk, results punk. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's going out there that Believe me, I don't, I can't even understand. I don't tweet, I don't go on Facebook. I mean, I'm really old school, but I've heard talks about it. And the issue I think is really important for Caesar too, is to address issues about who owns this information now, who controls it, because I know a lot of folks in who are participating in George Church's studies, for example, and who are on the internet, who are parents, who are disease um, focus groups, et cetera, aren't waiting and are taking charge. And I think this is a big challenge to NIH and to CSER to get, to get on board and to really understand what would be good evidence and not and to really help people. And I, so I applaud your helping. And I guess I just think this is a challenge for all of us. Uh, Katrina Armstrong mm -hmm. from MGH. I just wanted to pick up, I think, on two points that I agree offer. I I would say an amazing opportunity for the next version of Caesar. So one is just to echo the sense of the importance of diagnosis, and in some ways, the opportunity for the genomic medicine program to lead in reintroducing that into medicine altogether. So I will say that one of the things that I found incredibly distressing was about two years ago, to, I discovered that internal medicine residents are now graded on a million different things. There's some 20 competencies in particular but the ability to make a diagnosis doesn't show up on there at all. <laughs> it's not one of the competencies that we consider fundamental to internal medicine. And so I think the concept that that is, but I think the key piece is that those competencies were actually driven by a belief that we were focusing more on our patients and that actually making a diagnosis was kind of a doctor-focused thing and that actually I think your story brought, I think, home the concept that having a diagnosis is an incredibly patient-centered moment. And being able to frame that in genomics could be an incredibly powerful thing, I think, for pulling the whole field back. The other thing I would just say is I think your story also brought up this key point for Caesar of how critical it is to engage the communities, whether we define the communities as an area or a community and, you know, a population of an area or a community with a disease. And the opportunity, I think, for Caesar 2.0 to really focus on how that could become part of this triad of the tools, the delivery, and then the community. Uh, Pilar, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, so a couple of things. One is I, I wanted to agree again on the importance of diagnosis, and we've seen this at our own institution that we have a three major healthcare payers, one of whom just says basically we won't pay for genetics except in these very, very narrow contexts. Um, and so I, this argument about the importance of diagnosis is something that our practitioners are trying to develop and make back to payers, and they're kind of gathering their own data, but it would be really useful to have additional data. Um, at the same time, I also think that it's, it's very important to actually study um, the impacts of the kinds of activities that we heard described today because, for instance, we've heard some success stories. I'm sure not everything is a success story and for sure not every patient who gets back genetic information manages to find other people who have similar mutations and manages to find actually medically beneficial interventions, right? And so having some actual data as opposed to, I, I Love the really great stories. I have a student who actually did something similar. Um, but I just think actually having some data would be important. And then my final point is that I also think not 
there's a lot of variability in how people respond to this kind of information, how much they want to put themselves and their kid out there on the web. So again, we shouldn't assume that just because some people are doing that, that everybody would want to do that, which I think complicates our, um, our job uh, in thinking about how our policy should relate to um, the, the communities out there, okay? Yeah, just to follow up on that, I think one of the things that CSER has been very successful at is presenting to patients what do they want, what what are the important parameters when they're making a decision, is it, you know, how long you'll live, is it pediatric versus adult onset, what are the categories you want. You can't ask a patient about thousands of conditions one by one. Do you want this, do you want to do this? So how do you put those together in a way, Katrina's done a really nice job with her carrier screening uh, for classification. Other studies are collecting really good data on what proportion of patients would want VUSs versus would not want them. And those are really important data because we hear from the people who want everything, but we don't hear much from the people who want nothing, and they're out there. Actually, Gail, yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow up on your comment, which I thought was a very useful comment, that we've, right now we've been talking about this in the context of people who have some phenotype or some problem, and I think your comment is even more salient if we think about healthy individuals who aren't, don't have a problem and, and think about secondary findings. I can't. Bob, okay. I actually want, wanted to ask you to, re, to um, uh, reflect a little bit on the following question, which is there, there's been a lot of data now, as, as Gail mentioned and others, on how patients respond to particular information or what kind of information would they want and how would they like it returned to them. Um, are we done now with that question and can we now go on or is this something which is going to change over time as society changes and as generations age and do we need to ask these questions again? You know, I don't think I don't think we're done with the answers to this question. I think from Caesar over the next year, two years, you're going to see a lot more information about people, how people actually respond when they get the information back, and and there may be some surprises in there, like people may be very interested in getting the piece of information related to their phenotype, but then they may lose interest in getting the other pieces of information that are not related to their phenotype, but that are more secondary. Um, you know, I I think implicit in your question is. Is there a generational effect in our, you know, sort of older people thinking about it one way, and when the sort of younger generation comes along, they'll think about it very differently? You know, our experience in the, our um, Dana Farber project with a mostly older adult uh, population is uh, great enthusiasm about getting results back, at least, uh, uh, you know, when asked initially for preferences. I have no reason to believe that younger generations are going to be less enthusiastic about it, but there's there, there's not a lot of room to go up, if you will. Um, but you know, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll see. I also think that there is a, um, like many other areas of science, it's iterative in the sense that once we answer certain questions about this topic, we'll find new questions and new nuances to explore further. To add one thing, I'm not yet sure that we've figured out how to phrase the question directly to patients or families or people about, you know, what it is that you want back. We, we may be asking the question in a very primitive way. Yeah, I, I would underscore that. My, my sense is that uh, certainly in, in our project that uh, there's so many things that have moved, and the way that we ask questions now, I mean, the field changes so quickly. I, I, it, would, it would be great to have an opportunity in 2.0 to reformulate the questions. So obviously, so the technology has kind of advanced. The, the, even the, the way of understanding, when, we, when you say, would you want life information, we can ask about uncertainty and, and different ways of, of phrasing that. We can ask about um, how it might impact the, their, their course of care and, and um, the use of, uh, there, there's, there's a whole different series of ways that we're going to want to ask the questions. And then there's the diversity. So you know, when we go to populations that haven't really been part of CESAR 1.0 and, and, and then how do we even ask those questions and pursue that there. So I think there's a lot to do. And in fact, um, it's, it's crucially important to maintain that because I don't know, again, I mentioned this before, but I don't know that there's another funding mechanism that allows us to ask those questions in parallel with pushing uh, the, the latest out there. We're back, Amy. Yeah. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Um, Amy McGuire from Baylor College of Medicine. So I just wanted, I, I, I find it very interesting the tension that's being discussed because on the one hand, I think we're all acknowledging that 
there are individual differences in how people feel about these things, and I think we're seeing that in our CSER projects. And I think one of the major challenges that we've had within the CSER consortium is to account for individual and group differences and trying to distinguish sort of how people hang together. You know, it's, it's based on their particular clinical presentation, phenotype, it might be based, there, there are certain people who are inherently more enthusiastic about this or less concerned about their privacy or things like that. And so I guess it's kind of a question, kind of a comment, but that's intention, I think, with our need and desire to have sort of standard um, policies and, and sort of guidelines in place for how we treat all patients. And so there's been a, a very robust discussion about sort of not everybody wants to have their kid out on the internet, some people do, and how do we, from a policy perspective, um, address those differences. And I personally think that, that CSER and CSER 2.0 is really well poised to try to figure out how we categorize people, and we can't do it on an of one individual basis, right? We've got to have some unifying categories, but how do we account for those differences among different groups and what are the, the relevant groups, um, and how do we adjust our policies um, to, to take that into consideration? So I just was wondering, I don't know if Steve or anybody else has thoughts on how we can um, best address that in the next phase. I mean, I think we're addressing it in this phase because in some sense we're talking about bringing genomics into medicine and so it's inherently individualized, right? You might have some defaults in ways that you approach populations and some places where there are sort of policies that are enforced ac across all population, but it's when it's one clinician with one patient or one family, there's inevitably going to be a, a component of individualization to it and I think that that's one of the places where Caesar has, or the work that CSER and the CSER investigators have done has had a lot to say because we're learning how to individualize that in individual interactions with particular uh, patients. So how do we make, the, some of the decisions that are to be made here are what you might call preference sensitive decisions. And how do you make preference sensitive decisions together with uh, families? And then at the same time, for example, what are the defaults that you might have in place? So if uh, somebody does, you know, what are the sort of presumptions about the ways that you might go and if a family wants to do something differently, then they go a different way. So I think CSER is informing both of those things, how to no sort of negotiate those individual preferences with individual patients, and at the same time, what sorts of defaults make sense across a clinic, across a health system, et cetera. So I hate to be totally provocative, but I'm from Vermont where healthcare reform is raging. And so I, I think that a lot of the research that's been done by CSER comes from a medical genetics perspective which comes from a background of looking at genetic information as exceptional as um, should be protected. And, and I wonder if we wouldn't have a different approach to this. If it, I mean, so my ultimate question is, how much choice should families, individuals, patients be given in knowing or not knowing information that's medically important and could save money within the health system and provide better health care? I think your, your question is potentially one of the further areas for research in the next, um, in CSER 2.0. In other words, not only the empirical issues of how does this information impact the health system, but how should it? And I think that, so I think, I don't think there's a simple answer to your question, but I think it's one of the open areas for further work. Right, and thinking about like a public health perspective of people don't have choices about sexually transmitted diseases being reported and follow-up being done. So I've just been thinking about Bob's question about do we know enough about the choices patients have and what they want back and are we done with that? And, you know, this question of some patients want back VUSs, others don't, you know, we've figured that out. But the truth is, you know, if, if Matt had been given not just two variants that were almost known, but instead a VCF file with thousands of VUSs that were probably in his son's genome, he might not have gotten as quickly to where he is today. And so, I mean, the point is that not all VUSs are created equal. And I think that one physician getting a report with a VUS back on it, and I've seen this happen all the time, oh, I'm sure it's pathogenic and they just don't want to make the call. To the other physician who probably rightly says most VUSs will end up being benign, which is actually what we understand today, including the list of 100 that Dan just found on Exact. So I think we need to do a better job of trying to figure out how how to return variants that are uncertain, 
you know, and and what do we do with that and try and figure out how we'll make them certain in the future and try to contextualize and figure out what to do from there. Two really quick comments, Jim, then Debbie, then we have to turn yeah, to the end. I just want to echo what Heidi says. I think it would be an abdication of our responsibility were we to not make any judgments. We have to make some judgments, and there will be things that are more actionable than others. And, and I think we have to figure out ways of, of adjudicating those things. Uh, Debbie? But I just wanted to bring up, too, that uh, it's obvious that the public is interested in engaging. And perhaps in the next phase of Caesar, we could think of some way to accomplish this. And the Mendelian centers uh, were starting to, to develop a website called MyGene2, where people can come to us with their clinical sequencing data and it could become incorporated in Mendelian findings. Like Matt, if, if he got uh, 1,000 variants or 500 variants, could have come and his data could be put together with lots of people's data. So if they want to engage in this, they can, right? And I think more and more people will use social networking as a way to get information that's really important to their families and to their uh, uh, diagnosis. So I think that Caesar should think about using this in novel ways too, because there are obviously people who want to engage, and maybe this is the way we'll identify other cases of that variant that we're not sure of and could get more clinical phenotypes associated with that. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Steve and Matt, as well as the group, for this great conversation. I'm going to turn this over to Shanita, who's going to make some summary comments now.